Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Dave Bennett. I'm the chairman of the board of NAC TV here, and I'm pinch hitting for some of the volunteers that usually read the news from the Nipah Press and Banner. NAC TV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 12, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at NACTV.TV. These programs are made possible by our volunteer staff advisors as well as donations by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or by volunteering. We need both. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or NACTV at WCG wcgwave.ca This week's issue of the Nipah Banner and Press Friday, July the 10th, 2020 Volume 124 Of course, the big storm that was in Nipah this past and uh, the damage is, highlights the banner this week On the front page, storm causes Park Lake Earthen Dam to burst there's an aerial photograph there, gives you a perspective of the lake, which was breached on early morning of July the 1st. And the breach ended up emptying the lake back down through the river flow, causing a lot of damage. Sections of water, Walker Street were hit hard by the water. And the picture is by John Luigi Pido uh, from a drone. He does uh, quite a bit of this around town. We appreciate that from him. The article, front page article, is by Owen Devereaux, and it reads as follows. The activities that took place on Canada Day 2020 are something that Nipua has never experienced before or ever likely wants to experience again. On July 1, the town declared a local state of emergency following a pair of massive storms which caused severe flooding throughout the region. Those two significant weather events combined dropped an estimated 101 to 152 millimeters, that's about four to six inches, uh, of rainfall. Nipua Mayor Blake McCutcheon told the Banner and Press that those types of numbers in such a short period of time have not been seen here before. Quote, I can say that I have lived in this community for over 40 years and I've never seen anything like it. Many other people I have spoken to have said the same. This is like nothing we've experienced before, said McCutcheon. We thought we were in pretty good shape as of July the 1st at 7 a.m., Everyone had been up all night on June 30th, but then around 7 a.m. we received the call that Park Lake had breached. And then everyone came back. But really, at that point, there was nothing we could do. It was just way too much water, way too quick. The state of emergency which came into effect at 4 p.m. on Wednesday was isolated to the northeast and southeast parts of the community. The town said in a local media post, that the reason for the isolations is to access emergency services and utilize all means of necessary to save structures and infrastructure. The article is continued on page 13. Nipua bands together to give people property safe. The breach forced the town to put down a large section of earth on the intersection of Tupper Avenue and Mill Street in order to keep the water flow that was going across the park from reaching the nearby houses. Sandbags were also placed down along the curbs of Mill, Davidson, and Hamilton Streets. Unfortunately, some homes on Mill were struck with notable flood damage before the precautions could be fully installed. As of Thursday, July the 2nd, Lyons Riverbend Park and Campground had been completely overrun with water on two separate occasions, but nearby homes did remain safe. People step up to help. In response to the unprecedented rain and flooding, a large contingent of private citizens also stepped up to help when it mattered most. People volunteered to fill sandbags on Canada Day. McCutcheon said that those people combined with the town administration staff and council members who had been working around the clock should be commended. Quote, the people who came out to lend a hand, we had so many trucks. It was phenomenal, McCutcheon stated. Everybody stepped up because by lunchtime, many members of our staff had already been going nonstop. Manager of Operations Denise Saguet and Public Works Supervisor Andrew Hall, even Councillor Daryl Girard, you could just tell he'd been up all night, but he was still at it. Several others as well. 
members of council and the staff. We're just very fortunate to see people come out and offer their help. It is so appreciated. Some notable updates. The town of Nipua has notified residents that as of Thursday, July the 2nd, the sewage system is nearing capacity. They are encouraging everyone in town to limit their water usage as much as possible. By Monday, July 6, the following preventative measures had been done or were in the process of completion. A permanent berm will be constructed at the water treatment plant, a temporary berm built near Tupper and Mill, and plans for permanent ones to be put in place immediately. Hamilton Street and Park Lake Bridges accessed. Hamilton has been found to be still in good condition, but Park Lake will require reconstruction. Plans are being put in place to ensure access to the area as quickly as possible. In the coming days and weeks, council and staff will begin to assess the damages and put a plan together that will either resurrect what existed prior to the flood or utilize the opportunity to reinvent and change for the better. The playground at Riverbend Park will remain closed until further notice. The sand and grass area is contaminated from the draining of Park Lake and is considered unsafe for children and pets. The pool will, however, remain open, but people are asked to please park along streets and do not block driveways or roads. And there's a couple of pictures here on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the paper where the citizens came out and are filling the sandbags. Uh, citizens of Nipua assembled on July the 1st to help with filling and distributing sandbags to assist in low-lying areas of the community. Photos by Owen Devereaux. That's the end of that main article. I don't know if we can get the picture, but that's a fantastic picture that we got on the front page. It just shows the whole of Park Lake uh, drained pretty well, and the stream that which is actually uh, Stony Creek still running through the middle of it and coming out through the breach in the bottom of the picture there. The paper is flooded with information this week. The Rural Municipality of Rosedale working to repair flood damage infrastructure. This is by Kira Patterson. There's a couple of photos there of some uh, damage in the rural area. They were submitted. It reads, Rural municipalities around Nipawa have been feeling some of the effects of the flood as the swell in the White Mud River and other creeks traveled their way up. The rural municipality of Rosedale is just one of many that have been experiencing high water levels. A state of local emergency was declared in Rosedale on June 29th because of overland flooding from the excessive rainfall on June 28th, which hit again overnight on June 30th. Michael Porrick, Reeve for the RM of Rosedale, explained that they got between 5 and 7 inches of rain throughout the municipality on Sunday night, then received a range of 2 to 7 inches Tuesday night, which caused even more problems. We're just hoping we don't receive any more rain, he said, otherwise we'd be in a tough situation. Porrick noted that the hardest hit area was the southern part of Rosedale, with multiple culverts and bridges washed out, as well as Spring Hill Colony being 3 feet underwater, overnight between June 30th and July the 1st. Of course, we're all scrambling, trying to close roads and find enough road signs. Safety was, of course, the number one concern, he said. Between June 30th and July the 2nd, Porrick estimated that upwards of a dozen bridges and culverts had been washed out and hundreds of roads had to be closed due to water running over them. Since the initial rush, the water levels have gone down significantly. While it's still high, running through culverts and ditches at capacity, there's no longer flooding on the roads. Porrick explained that now they can see the damage more clearly and there are a lot of roads that have to be uh, undermined and are sinking, uh, roads that have been undermined and are sinking. The Reeve noted that they are asking the public to stay off the roads as much as possible. Only local residents should be using the roads and only when necessary. The financial toll this damage will take is yet to be determined, but, Porrick stated, it will be a significant amount. When they declared a state of local emergency, the RM asked the province for some assistance and had the Manitoba Emergency Measures Organization on site to survey the damage which was caused. Right now, the RM is trying to repair the roads as quickly as they can. We're just asking for cooperation from all of our ratepayers and the public we're working to get everything repaired, but it's going to take some time and patience, Porrick expressed. And in the pictures on the right, 
Uh, it doesn't say where they are exactly. So two of the washed out roads in the Spring Hill and Franklin area, they were submitted photos of. And then an article by Casper Wareham on the bottom here on the left. We're all hoping for good weather. Colin Wallman provides an update on the state of Spring Hill Colony. The Banner and Press has received an update on the state of Spring Hill Colony. The colony, located approximately 10 minutes, well, it might have been 10 minutes then, but it might take you longer to get there today. Uh, anyway, 10 minutes northwest of Nipawa was one of the areas affected by the flooding that occurred after storms swept the region early last week. In an interview carried out the morning of July 2, Colony Secretary and Manager Colin Woolman provided details on the situation. We're trying to do cleanup right now, and there's lots of people helping with that. Neighbors, friends, the community's been so supportive, and we're trying to do the best we can, said Walmano. The flooding has gone down, but we're preparing for more in case we get more showers. We're all hoping for good weather. At the time of the interview, work was also being done to clean out basements, kitchens, saving anything the community could, such as canning supplies, repairing roads, and tending to any other areas that needed to be addressed. We're all trying to be careful, checking our dikes and reinforcing them, getting aqua dams and sandbagging in place at areas that may be at risk if waters rise again, Woolman added. When the floodwaters hit, a total of 140 people were evacuated and housed in the colony's gym. Though basements were still unusable at the time, these people were able to return to their homes afterwards. Hopefully it stays that way. Our road is back in service as well, so people can get in and out, he said. In his closing thoughts, Woolman shared remarks of thanks and solidarity, stating, we've had a lot of help from the RM as well. The RM of Rosedale and the town of Nipua have been offering help and we're very grateful and thankful for all that support. As well, we're thinking about Nipua, Minidosa, Brandon, all the other areas that have been affected by this flooding and hoping that everyone is safe. And I'll go to the center section where there's some pictures of the flooding, how much we can get in view here, uh, and the bylines. These pictures, by the way, are courtesy of Dale Diath, Diane Warner, Owen Devereaux, John Drinkwater, and John Luigi Pito. The top left, Provincial Road 465, that is, 465, was completely washed out by the storm. Apparently the culvert from the road was swept into the adjacent field. The top row center, where it says heavy row rains broke dams and flood Westman, uh, is an aerial shot of the floodwaters as they reach the edge of Hillcrest Estates on Nipawa's southeast end. And you can see in the bottom right of that picture the footbridge that uh, residents used to cross from the Hillcrest Estates uh, back over into town. And it's flooded all through there. Uh, this shot is looking southeast, I guess. So top right. Volunteers assisting with the filling of snow ba uh, snowbanks, sandbags on July the 1st. Uh, very low-tech operation there. And in the center row on the left, a view of Park Lake Berm after it collapsed. So you see, a lot of people thought that it was the spillway dam that had, uh, had uh, collapsed. But no, it was the earthen dam that uh, went from the spillway around to the water treatment plant and it broke through in the corner of that area. You can see in this picture the water's rushing through. Uh, the uh, height of the broken part of the dam, earthen dam, is about four to six feet, it looks like. So I'm guessing there's four to six feet deep of water in there as well. Because uh, from the front, the picture on the front page uh, indicates that that uh, break is maybe 10 feet uh, in depth. In the middle, that's road 87 north uh, that has been flooded over located a little northwest of Arden. And on the right, in the middle row, volunteers helping to sandbag a home on Mill Street in Nipawa. And the gentleman on the left there in the red shirt's knee deep in water. On the bottom here, we have pictures. There's the pelicans. Uh, they're trying to adjust to the new landscape down there. Uh, they're hanging around, so fishing must be good, I guess. So. And on the right, the last picture on the bottom right here is the campground area uh, 
the road going across the picture is Highway 16. The road going through to the north is Highway 5. And you can see in the left-hand edge there the campground and kiosk for Lions Campground. Well, I have uh, somebody else with me here today to help read the news, uh, Charcy Magwood. Charcy is our summer student uh, that is here at the uh, at NEC TV, we're very happy to have her. And Charcy was the Governor General's medalist at NECI, and for the top top academic award uh, she received uh, at the graduation exercise. So I invite Charcy to come in here now, and she's going to read a little bit. Hi. So here on page 12, we have Stony Creek School survives another flood, and we have a picture here of the inside of the Stony Creek School. This scene is what greeted Andrew Hall when he entered the Stony Creek School for an inspection on Saturday, July 4th. It appears that flood water did not enter the schoolhouse. Then we have a short article by Ken Waddell. It's almost an annual event. Every time there's a heavy rain, the flood water surrounds the Stony Creek Schoolhouse at Lyons River Bend Park in Nipawa. The school has been photographed during and between floods on hundreds of occasions. Originally moved in from west of Nipawa to River Bend Park, the the little one-room school is a museum set up as students would have seen it many years ago. With the latest flood rising to record levels, it was feared the schoolhouse would be badly damaged. Local Lions Club member Tom Borsa said the town crew accompanied him to the school, and while the flood silt is in a layer on the deck, it looks as if the building did not actually get any water in it. Borsa said, that's good news, but the crawl space under the school is insulated and will have to be inspected. We don't know if there's damage there and we will damage there until we get someone to look into that. Then on the second half of the page we have stranded on the farm and it reads a distressed calf found itself stranded among the floodwaters that covered the Patterson farm on Canada Day. The calf was spotted and the family trudged through the waters to check on the animal. When it was found that the calf was too tired to walk with them and too large to carry Resolving the issue in a creative manner, a pallet was brought to float the calf to safety of dry land. The next day, the calf was back to its usual self and has since been reunited with its mother. And at the top, we have a picture of them rescuing it, and at the bottom, we have a picture of it the next day looking a lot better. Um, now we will go back to Dave. <laughs> Hello, I'm back. And thank you, Charcy, for taking over and reading those uh, items. Uh, I'm going to start back on page two. Farmery Estate Brewery adds second location to Nipawa. Chris and Lawrence Warwick of Farmy Estate Brewery pose in front of the brand new location in Nipawa, located right beside Subway on Highway 16. It's in the picture there. And they have another picture of a variety of the products that include merchandise that will be on sale and is on sale normally at Farmery location. The article is by Ken Waddell. Farmery Estate Brewery in Nipua has been looking for a second location for a while now, according to Eric Warwick, one of Farmery's owners. With COVID-19 precautions in place, it was difficult to keep tours going along with our retail sales. We've been looking for a Highway 16 location, and the space beside Subway is ideal. Nipua Subway is located near the junction of Highway 16 and Highway 5 north, very close to the farmery's headquarters, which is on Highway 5. While the brewery, food truck, and retail, retail location on Highway 5 is good and has served the company well, Warwick is optimistic that the new location will bring even more traffic to come in and enjoy their many varieties of beverages. New signage went up last week and the new store is open for business, offering farmery's full line of beer, pop, and other products. So, of course, also on page three, uh, every week is our advertisement for big, Bigger Bingo. Thank you to those who participate. and Maybe we could encourage some others to uh, come along and play bingo as well. It's one of our major fundraisers for the station. The Bonanza coming up is worth 6240 bucks. The uh, X is 150 The Blackout is $781.50. And the Toonie Pot is $2,690 and going up weekly. Bingo cards are available for $12 per pack at Harris Pharmacy, your dollar store, Tim Toms, or here at the NAC TV office. So please help support NAC TV. Also, volunteers, we're looking for them. 
We could do with a couple more people that might like to read the news and do this program. It's not that difficult to do. On page four, oh, I love Tundra. The uh, 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 little cartoons that are always always in here. A couple of snails, and the one is in cramped quarters. And the little comment is, you got sucked into the tiny home fad, eh? And a couple of snails, and the one's trying to downsize their, their home. It's always got animals in that. Uh. Anyway, Ken's article is, of course, always on page four. This is right in the center by Ken Waddell. His article this week is entitled, Time to Change, Care Home Policy. Forgive me, he starts off, by repeating the information below. Just about everybody has seen these statistics or heard them, but it's important for the context. Manitoba COVID-19 update as of Monday, July the 6th. Zero new cases. Uh, 1,749 were tested over the past weekend. Six days in a row with zero cases. It has been seven weeks since a healthcare worker in Manitoba contracted COVID-19. The number of active cases has decreased by two. The number of cases remains at 325, and the number of deaths remains at seven. An additional two have recovered for a total of 304 recoveries. And that leaves 14 active cases in the province right now. Zero are in hospital, including zero in intensive care. And a total of 66,717 tests have been conducted. The province, Manitoba Health, all the health care staff, home care workers, I'm sorry, care home workers, and Manitobans in general have done a very good job of curtailing COVID-19. The battle isn't over, but it is indeed time for some different tactics. Let's look at what happened. Many people are very afraid, afraid for their health and lives. Many businesses have suffered greatly from the shutdown. Some will not recover. Parts of Canada and parts of the world have suffered very deeply over this disease. We all know that. What we don't know and will never know is what would have happened in Manitoba if Manitoba had not shut down the economy. Would there have been a huge epidemic? We'll never know. Only speculation can really deal with that question. What we do know is reflected in the stats above. For the most part, COVID-19 has been kept at bay from hospitals, care homes, schools, the meat packing plants, and from the population in general. It is now time to change how we do things, and the place to start is the care homes. As stated above, healthcare workers have not contracted C-19 in several weeks. That is wonderful news. The care and caution that has been taken have apparently helped a lot. That all said, in our care homes, residents are suffering in another way. They are suffering and dying from loneliness. They are feeling very alone and in many cases are totally confused about not having any visitors. Similarly, people are being deprived of seeing their spouses, their parents or grandparents, their friends. It's a horrible situation. The current visitation protocol imposed by Manitoba Health on care homes is totally out of line, says Canada. They say it's to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Okay, we all get that, but keeping visitors away over such a long haul isn't helping. There's only been one death in a Manitoba care home. There have been many, many deaths in the care homes from things such as influenza, and we have no idea how many elderly people have just given up and died of loneliness. Keeping visitors away doesn't make sense anymore, and here is why. Staff have to have their temperature taken, are warned not to come to work if they aren't feeling well and have to take numerous precautions. But they all go home and live with their families who are going to work and in other places. They all go shopping and they're going about their business in a more or less regular fashion. Then they come back to work in the care home. That's the way it has to be. Society has to keep working, sleeping, eating and going about life as much as is possible. My point is that regular controlled visits from family and friends will pose no greater risk than the regular coming and going of staff does. Certainly, take all the precautions, take people's temperature, fine. Wear a mask if needed. Don't come in if you're sick. Don't come in if you've been out of the province or out of the country. And yes, there is some risk that a care home resident might get C-19 and could die. But think about it, please, especially Manitoba Health. Please think it through. There is very small risk that C-19 will come into the care homes. 
Influenza is already there. Loneliness, emotional stress, leading to people simply giving up on life is already there. Far more, older, far more elderly people are dying in Manitoba from the side effects of the fight against COVID-19 than are actually dying from the disease itself. Manitoba Health can take pride in their success but need to change their approach before their efforts turn into a bigger threat than COVID-19 itself. And of course, Ken always has a disclaimer on the bottom of his piece. The writer serves as a volunteer chair of the Manitoba Community Newspaper Association. The views expressed in this column are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the MCNA board or banner and press staff. Now, there's a couple of uh, interesting uh, little letters. Uh, people wrote in here on page five. This one's entitled, Warm Memories of Small Town Support. Signed by Grandpa Dave Connell from Winnipeg. It reads, Dear Ken Waddell, I enjoyed your television show on NACTV with the Mayor of Nipawa, and later your program with your staff regarding your newspaper. I attended Rivers Collegiate Institute in the 60s and played Nipawa Collegiate in Red River School Division High School in 64 and 65. And we won the Provincial Rural Championship in 65. We were part of the team members inducted into the Football Manitoba Hall of Fame in 2013 for our unique undefeated accomplishment, as the Rivers Banner will attest to, during the 100th anniversary of Rivers coverage in July 2013. As a Canadian Armed Forces brat dependent, when my father was at the Rivers Tri-Service Base, your conversation reminded me of the reason why I have always chosen to declare Rivers, Manitoba, as my hometown, in spite of being born in Edmonton, Alberta. I was brought up in Canada and we moved every 28 months in my youth on average. The warm memories of the small town community togetherness and support there in Rivers uh, Every, it should, should also make every Nipawa participant, uh, should make every Nipawa person who is in the recent flood emergency, make them proud of the community family response that your mayor expressed so well. I pray for your long and profitable newspaper service to Nipawa area, Grandpa Dave Connell, Connell. And there's three th thumbs up in the paper, all thumbs up this week, and really so they should be because everybody was pulling their weight this week. Uh, first from Grandma Eileen Walton, thumbs up and hats off to the hardworking people who organized and pulled off a unique and well done graduation ceremony at NACI. This must have taken many hours to come up with and execute a graduation that the graduates will remember for the rest of their lives. So, well done people. And the second one, thumbs up and sincere thanks to all the wonderful neighbors and volunteers who filled, delivered and sandbagged our home on Manawaka Drive on Canada Day. I think that's in Hillcrest area. Uh, signed Cal and Nettie Williams. And another one, thumbs up to the Franklin community for all the help they gave us after our basement was flooded. It was very much appreciated. Ron and Sharon Petch. And another good news story here under the bottom, Nipua Palliative Care wins the BPCF draw. A picture of that drawing being made and a bit of an explanation in the byline. The Beautiful Plains Community Foundation, BPCF, held another of their 25 Days of Giving draws on Friday, July the 3rd. The draws started at the beginning of the year, running every second week, and are part of the celebration of the Foundation's 25th anniversary. Each week, an organization from the Beautiful Plains area is drawn, and a prize amount is also drawn to decide how much that organization receives. This week, the Nippon District Palliative Care was drawn and will be receiving $500. So, lucky them, and thanks to the foundation for all the work they do, uh, raising funds in our local area here and doling them out, of course. So. Well, we'll move over. On page six, Helen Drysdale, she always has some interesting uh, uh, things to say in the paper, and this is called Harvesting and Threshing. The picture of the Baker and Pool outfit, Stook Threshing on the Pool Farm, April 21, 1916. Photo courtesy of the Beautiful Plains Museum. 
George Baker's on the separator, Irvin Baker with great team on the grain wagon, Stanley Baker on another grain team, and AGM Pools Ford car can be seen in the photograph. And here's some history uh, from Helen. In 1830, it took about 275 hours of labor to produce 100 bushels of wheat. In the 1870s, 40 years later, horse-driven binders were introduced and a short time later threshers. By 1890, the time to produce 100 bushels had decreased to about 50 hours. So. I understand today it's about two hours. So. The process to harvest grain began with horse-drawn binders that would cut the wheat stalks, gather them into bundles called sheaves, and tie them. The sheaves would then be stooped. It took skill to stook as the 8 to 12 sheaves that leaned against one another needed to stay upright for several weeks to dry the grain. Later a steam engine and threshing machine came by to thresh the grain. The threshing machine was connected to the engine with a belt about 60 plus feet long. The distance was so that the engine would not set fire to the straw stack that had been thrashed. The sheaves were picked up on the f in the field with horses and racks and hauled to the thrasher. The straw man fed straw into the firebox to run the steam engine, and when the gauge on the engine showed that, smaller print, hard to read, showed that the drive wheel was turning 150 revolutions a minute, the engineer gave a toot and the work began in earnest. The sheaves brought to the thresher were thrown in from both sides. It took two men to haul water to the large steam engines for the great beast to run. By 1900, around 1800 men came from the east to help with the harvesting. The trains had a special rate for the harvesters to come. A threshing crew would need at least 20 men and up to 30 sometimes. Early threshing machines had a bagger which held two bags, one being filled and the other being replaced with an empty bag. The sewer sewed full bag shut. The sewer, I'm sorry. The sewer sewed full bag shut with a needle and thread and then the bags were loaded into the grain wagon. Wheat bags held two bushels each, bushel weighing 60 pounds. It took strength and endurance to hoist 120 pounds all day long. No gym membership needed for those boys. Bagging the grain made storing simpler and travel to the elevator a lot easier. 1900, roads were a little better than dirt trails and the bag grain allowed the farmer to easily remove the bags from the wagon. If the wagon became stuck in a mud hole, it was all uh, dust, dirty and dusty job. When all the stooks were thrashed, the outfit packed up and went on to the next place. When I do the research of the olden days, there are many pictures of the threshing crews and outfits taken by professional photographers who came and gathered all the men for pictures. In those days, the housewife's job was busy enough, but during threshing time, it became worse. With no microwave oven, refrigerator, or frozen foods to ease the work, the women cooked and baked for several days in a row, fixing huge meals for the threshing crews. Many loaves of bread, large platters of roast meat, pots of potatoes, and gravy, vegetables, desserts, gallons of tea and coffee were consumed. If all went well with good weather, no breakdowns, the men were around for about a week. There was often friendly rivalry between the ladies about who fed the men better. Everyone would pitch in, including the kids who would run water to the ladies in the kitchen, wood for the stove, and lunch to the field. Pies were always on the menu for dessert. They were kept simple with ingredients they had on hand, such as berries, rhubarb, cream and eggs, almost anything could be put in between two pie crusts. And then she has an example here. It's quite intriguing. It's green tomato pie. I guess you could put anything between the pie crusts. Green tomato pie. I'll just read it. You cut the, in slices one and a half pounds of green tomatoes. So stew them with a syrup made by boiling one and a half cups of sugar and one and a half cups of water for five minutes. So then you add the grated rind of a lemon and one teaspoon of cinnamon. Cook until the tomatoes are transparent. Add one and a half cups of raisins and cook for five minutes longer and then use between the two pie crusts. Green tomato pie. Well, how about that? Here's Owen's column on uh, page six. Owen Devereaux. His column like I see him, he always says, and it's his column. It's entitled, Anyone Bother to Ask the Culture in Question on How to Respect the Culture. Read that again. Anyone Bother to Ask the Culture in Question on How to Respect the Culture. All right. 
who's ready to have an uncomfortable conversation about cultural representation in sports, says Owen this week. Anyone? Hello, where did everybody go? <laughs> okay, maybe that's not the right tack to start this off, so let me try again, because this feels like one of those topics where I should be very careful on how I approach it. A basic question to begin. What do the Washington Redskins, Cleveland Indians, Atlanta Braves, Kansas City Chiefs, Edmonton Eskimos, Chicago Blackhawks, and the Nippon Natives all have in common? Well, the most recent correct answer to that question would be they've all had the phrase, change your name, retweeted towards them online. For those of you outside of the social media bubble, and quite honestly, you are the people I envy the most, all this began with the NFL's Washington Redskins. The franchise is once again facing intense public scrutiny on their name, which is considered a racial slur in dictionary entries. But this time it appears as though change may be on the horizon. As FedEx has asked the team to reconsider the moniker, with investors from Nike and PepsiCo quickly following suit. Last week, 87 shareholders representing $620 billion in assets wrote a letter asking those companies to cut ties with the team if it didn't change its name. As well, by Monday, July the 6th, Nike, Walmart, and Target had all removed the team's merchandise from their websites. With pressure intensifying, team owner Dan Snyder released a statement saying that they would be conducting a thorough review of the name. Now that's a complete 180 compared to a quote from Snyder back in 2013, where he stated that, we'll never change the name. It's that simple, never. You can use caps. Well, now, isn't that just amazing how quickly you can find your social conscience once it starts impacting your cash flow? <clears throat> Only one way to know for sure, Owen goes on to put a little headline in, but along with the Washington Redskins potatoes, and other teams with a name or logo affiliated with First Nations culture seem to have been bombarded with intense reactions on both sides of the argument. For the sake of your sanity, don't dive into any of this online debate. It'll just make you feel very tired, he says. It sounds like he's speaking from experience. So. <clears throat> I, like everyone else, it seems, have a pretty entrenched opinion on the subject. But unlike every current keyboard deplorable and snowflake out there, I won't be sharing it with you today, because it doesn't matter. Due to my ethnic heritage, I probably only have a free pass to share my opinion on exactly two teams, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame and the Boston Celtics. As it now stands, neither one offends me. Now, if they were to change their name to the Drunken Irish of Notre Dame or to the Boston Paleskins, then I have some problems with the whole thing, but at this time we're good. Don't get me wrong, while I can still chime in on this particular topic if I want to, I'm not the cultural demographic that needs to be heard at this moment. In all the online back and forth, only once or twice have I seen anyone suggest that we check in with the First Nation, Inuit and Métis, and see what they think about this whole hubbub. Do you know what Washington Redskins, Cleveland Indians, Atlanta Braves, Kansas City Chiefs, Edmonton Eskimos, Chicago Blackhawks and Nippon Natives should all have in common? They should all be ramping up their engagement with their nearest First Nation communities, with the exception now of the Florida State Seminoles, who've actually built a 70-year working relationship with the Seminole tribe. Where is the current and ongoing consultation from any of these teams? Because what was all good, and you had permission to do, 75 years, 25 years, or even five years ago, might not fly now. So perhaps it's best to have an updated conversation with the parties that the teams are claiming to honor. The best way to know that you're doing the right thing is to ask the people you're trying to do right by. Who knows, you might be surprised by the response. I've seen First Nations people wearing Chicago Blackhawks, Blackhawks t-shirts and Washington Redskins hats. In fact, I once did an interview with a notable representative of Manitoba's Métis community as he wore a Chief Wahoo baseball cap. I was not expecting that, and quite honestly, what right would I have to say to that man of Métis heritage that his cap was problematic? The only way right now to know is to ask, are we good? If those community leaders say, yeah, we're all good, 
then fantastic. Sports racism has been solved. But if the answer is a non-consensus or an outright no, well, then it's time for that uncomfortable conversation we talked about earlier. Well, he certainly calls them like he sees them. Call them like I see them by Owen Devereaux. And his disclaimer, uh, it's a monthly opinion column for the Nipah Banner and Press. The views expressed in the article are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the Nipah Banner and Press. So, if you'd like to uh, send a letter to the editor, by all means, there's a topic you might like to uh, uh, write back to, to Owen on. Excuse me while I have a drink of water here. But be sure to sign it. All letters need to be signed, of course. <coughs> Moving on. And I'm on page 8, looking back columns and so on. And here's a little article about telephones in Nipawa, down here. A uh, picture courtesy of the Beautiful Plains Museum. Uh, it's a picture of the government telephone building that once stood in Nipua. The space is now occupied by the credit union and its parking lot, uh, which is now under renovation, of course. Uh, the article is by Casper Wareham, uh, writer with the Nipua Banner and Press, and the information was gathered from the Nipua Land of Plenty, uh, 1883 to 1983 heritage book. And Casper informs us that the Manitoba Government Telephones, MGT, came into being on January the 15th, 1908, and immediately began constructing rural lines in several areas, including the Nipah District. The MGT came after two other known telephone establishments at Nipawa, a telephone establishment managed by Mr. H. W. Gerhardt, mentioned in a Nipawa Press article dated May 28th of 1896, and in 1899, when a group of local merchants and farmers worked to establish the Nipua Municipal Telephone System. Well, they were local ones, I guess. And this now is the uh, provincial Manitoba government telephone building, uh, 1908, it said. It was later known as the Manitoba Telephone System. They erected a one-story manual exchange building in 1912 providing service to 200 telephones in Nipua and 300 on local farms within a few months. Nipua switched over to a dial service on November 16th of 1967. Well, that's interesting. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh, there's a good picture on page 9 of a deer enjoys a day of sunshine. Enjoying some sun time. Uh, in a field in the Glenella Lansdowne on July the 6th, upon spotting the photographer, the nimble animal bounded off. And I might just tell you, I did some video of uh, the flats area, and it was on News and Views there just past, and there was a fawn in the creek. Now, some of you that saw it, I don't know if you were able to see the fawn or not, it was trying to swim across the current and was unable to do so, and it was forced back to the middle of the, uh, of the flood area. And on the third attempt, it actually got swept downstream a little bit and got lucky in that it, uh, it found a little bit of less current and it was able to swim out and it managed to get out onto the dry grass. And we did capture that on video, so uh, that's a nice good news story too. And then, of course, the big flood came two days later, so we have no, no idea what happened after that. There would be a lot of animals uh, and birds that were caught in those floods uh, that lost their lives, I'm sure. Uh, had their habitat uh, turned upside down, that's for sure. And we looked at the flood pictures there, here. And the articles that Charcy read. So, moving ahead, what have we got? Okay, we'll move to... Page 15, this is the Carberry, North Cyprus, Langford News. Some uh, articles. Gladwin Scott writes the uh, information here. We appreciate him uh, at the Banner and Press here, and uh, I'm sure the Carberry uh, people uh, appreciate what he does as well. Gladwin, Gladwin's been a, a strong supporter of Carberry and area for many, many years in the sports and other areas. Thanks, Gladwin. Uh, 
The article with the picture of a goalie here, Carson Bjornsson, a 15-year-old goalie from Carberry, is joining the Rink Hockey Academy in Winnipeg starting next season. Uh, okay, Southwest Cougars and Yellowhead Chiefs, respectively. No, I'm sorry. Oh, here we are. Carson Bjornsson of the Southwest Cougars and Gavin Renwick, uh, I guess, of the Yellowhead Chiefs, respectively, join the Rink Hockey Academy. And they plan for big changes. They will join the Rink Hockey Academy in Winnipeg prior to school opening in September. Uh, of course, plans are all dependent on COVID there. Anyway, Bjarnason plans to live with friends in Niverville and attend classes at Tuxedo Shaftesbury High School, 9 to 12, in the like morning sessions, and then bus to the new rink hockey facility for skill development. He will play with the under-16 school team in the Canadian Schools Hockey League. I'm really excited about this opportunity, said Carson, who stars in basketball and fastball and is, strong, is a strong percussionist with the Carberry Collegiate Band. Bjornison was drafted by the Winkler Flyers in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League this spring. As his Hamiota uncle, Alan Matheson, once stated, if you're going to run with the big dogs, you've got to get off the kitchen porch. Yeah, there's a good quote. So uh, he's headed elsewhere for next year. Watch for Gavin Renwick next week. Ah, see, yeah. Uh, glad we'll have an article about Gavin, I guess, in next week's banner. And from his here and there, Gladwin has some information, uh, Carberry. Swimming lessons started at the Carberry Pool on July the 6th. They list the pool staff here. They include Cameron McMillan, the supervisor, Caitlin Myers, Noah Gosselin, Zoe Couples, and Quinn Thorne. They're St. Francis Xavier lifeguards. Tyler Hood, Braden Knox, and Aiden Town, assistant lifeguards. Annika Duguay and Tennille Steen cashiers, and I apologize if I've mispronounced some of those names. Some special regulations include enter through the rink and exit through the gate in the pool fence. Maximum of 10 people in the change rooms at any one time. Maximum of 75 people in the pool at any one time. Change rooms are used to change, use the bathroom and shower before getting into the pool. Social distancing, two meters, is still in effect. Staff will clean and sanitize throughout the day. <coughs> Hot, humid weather has made the pool attractive since its last use. <coughs> Excuse me. Catcher Lexi Unra helped the Westman Magic under 14 team to a good weekend at Ashley Newfeld Softball Complex in Brandon in the Manitoba Ladies Super League. They split with Smitty's of Winnipeg, winning the opener 5-2 and giving up two runs in the bottom of the seventh for a 3-2 loss. So, so nice to see that uh, fastball uh, is getting out there and being played. The Magic downed Eastman selects twice on Sunday, 9-zip in the first game and were leading 8-2 in the second, which was called due to lightning. Westman Magic under 14 fastball team blank Central Energy 7-0 twice in Brandon on Wednesday, July the 1st. Carberry's Lexi Unraw was injured in the first game but returned to collect two ribbies in the second contest as the Magic had a five-run fifth and a mercy rule victory. The Carberry News Express building has been sold to Eric Forbes, effective July 1, 2020. The Winnipeg Free Press slash Brandon Sun has owned the building since acquiring it from Jack and Bernice Lupton. Forbes indicated that he has no immediate plans but wanted to restore the front facade and was open to discuss with other entrepreneurs how maximum use can be made. So if you have ideas, then contact him. That's Eric Forbes. And uh, finally, in his articles from the uh, uh, Baseball League, the Santa Clara, I guess it is, Carberry Royals edged the Austin A's in Austin Friday, July the 3rd. Corey Billiart, Scott Murray, and Dale and Creasy did the pitching for Carberry. Right fielder Tori Scott threw out an A's runner trying to score from second base on a single for the fielding gem of the game. And there's a neat picture here of a vehicle, a car, a truck, sorry, and a young gal with her grad dress on. And it reads, an unknown gentleman from Winnipeg who was spending the day in Carberry jumped on the chance to get a picture of a classic car. Kirby Collegiate graduate Jaslyn Enns and her escort Jamie Paddock 
were visiting Jas Jaslin's employers at Lynx on Main on her graduation day, Wednesday, June 24th. The two grads had driven there in a 1953 Chevrolet Chuck built by Jaslin's father, Wes Enns, who spent six years putting the truck together just for her graduation. The Winnipeg man, Peter Sozek, happened to be at Lynx on Main at the same time, and the truck caught his eye. Sozik asked if he could get a picture of the truck and then offered to take a photo of the grads with it, which he shared with the Enns family. Well, that's kind of neat. A random act of photography in Carberry. How about that? Well, we're getting towards the back of the paper here. Oh, pardon me for a second. I'll have another drink of water. This is a warm job doing this. Couple more sports uh, items on page 18. Kozak, new hire for the Nipah Natives. So picture of Brett Kozak here, nice young man. Looks like the new partnerships manager and hockey operations assistant for the Nipah Natives. So I met him the other day, I think. It was a week or so ago. The Nipah Natives have added to their front office staff, announcing that Brett Kozak has been hired as the club's partnerships manager and hockey operations assistant. Kozak steps into the position after four years at the University of Regina, where he earned a diploma in business administration and a degree in sport and recreation management. In a media release announcing the new hire, general manager head coach Ken Pearson noted that the Junior A club is looking forward to seeing what Kozak brings to the table. Our focus over the past few years has been on raising corporate support and advertising revenues. As we move forward, our goal over the next year will be to focus on our game night presentation and community presence. We are impressed with Brett's energy, enthusiasm, and passion for hockey and our community and are very pleased that he's he has decided to join our team. We believe that he has the personality and drive to help raise the bar in Nipawa, said Pearson. Having grown up in Nipawa, Kozak noted that he was very excited about the opportunity to join the team in this manner. So he's a local boy. That's great. I'm looking forward to the challenges that lie ahead, said uh, Kozak. Nipawa is a great community and has huge potential. I'm going to set my goals high and work hard towards the growth of our corporate support and getting the community excited about our hockey club. Well, welcome, Brett. The other sports item uh, is a little baseball uh, item. Welcome back, baseball. We've missed you. Uh, this is a picture of the Cubs. Uh, somebody sliding into second or third base, looks like. <clears throat> a shortened Santa Clara Baseball League regular season returned to the Diamond on Friday, July the 3rd, with three games played. In Nipua, the Cubs defeated the Ebb and Flow Lakers 9-1. to Other games saw Carberry defeat Austin 3-1, to and the Portage and Plumas uh, Pirates played to a 1-1 draw. So the Cubs and the Royals have a win apiece. The Pirates and Padres have a tie each, and the Austin A's and the Ebb and Flow Lakers are, have no wins as yet. Just to tell you that the uh, NAC TV is filming all of the uh, home Cubs games this year. Uh, there will be one on this week. Uh, I think the one against, uh, uh, who did they play? The Ebb and Flow Lakers, and they play again tomorrow night. Uh, uh, so there'll be a new game each week for the next five weeks on NAC TV. If you're interested, join, check the newspaper or elsewhere for times and uh, start times. So. Okay, now on page 19, there's a uh, article here that says we're stronger together. And this is a picture of a Reverend Chad McCharles, uh, the newly hired by the Nipawa United Dash Anglican Shared Ministry. The article and photo are by Owen Devereaux. Nipua United and St. James Anglican Churches Amalgamate Services. Okay, Owen says, a pair of Nipua churches have decided to partner and become a single entity. Recently, representatives with the Nipua United and St. James Anglican Churches announced that they would be officially amalgamating the two congregations effective immediately. 
The two churches had already been working in a cooperative manner for several years, sharing in services and many other joint activities. Permission for a more formal partnership had been granted by both the Committee for the United Church and the Bishop of the Diocese of Brandon, William Cliff, who oversees the region's Anglican denominations. The Reverend Chad McCharles will serve as the minister for the new Nipua United Anglican Shared Ministry. We aren't creating a new denomination. What we're doing is that St. James and Nipua United are going to continue to exist but we're coming together at the board level to handle the concerns of ministry together, stated the Reverend McCharles. As part of this partnership, the decision was made to put the St. James Anglican Church building located at 535 Mountain up for sale and to hold all the services within the confines of the United Church. Reverend McCharles noted to the Banner and Press that the decision was partly based on costs, but that wasn't primarily the, fa the only factor. It wasn't the primary factor. One of the biggest factors in this becoming a reality is that St. James congregation discerning prayer fully over a number of years that it was time to let go of their building. The building is in good shape, that's not the issue. They just felt very strongly that the resources they were pouring into the building were no longer a good approach. It was better to pool resources, use them in an efficient way, and to be stronger from it. As for the conversations for the joining of the two sides, Reverend McCharles noted that those deliberations had been going on for about three to four years. In rural ministry, it's increasingly difficult to find clergy across the board denominationally. And so, Nipah United Church has been without a minister for a couple of years, the Anglican Church St. James has been without a minister for a few years as well, and so they found over that time it was easier to work together on certain things. One thing led to another, and they decided to combine worship over a couple of summers. So one month they'd all assemble in the United Church, and the next they'd go to the Anglican Church. So people started to ask the question, why aren't we together in a more formal way? Reverend McCharles said, as we progressed, we just realized that any of the obstacles, the hurdles, whatever you want to call them, that we had anticipated weren't as important as being together. During and quite separately from those discussions, Reverend McCharles and his family, who were originally from the region here, decided to return home to the prairies after a three-year stint in Nova Scotia. Reverend McCharles had previously serving as the priest for the Angl had previously served as the priest for the Anglican parish. He indicated that timing just worked out perfectly for them to be able to join with this significant opportunity. We'd made the decision to just come home. We returned without any calling or position to come to. We just knew it was time to come home, said Reverend McCharles. So it was around that time that our friends heard that we were returning to Nipua. So a conversation bubbled up with a friend who was a member of the United Congregation. And she asked the question, would you consider applying for the United Church position? Or looking into what the Anglicans in Unitans have been doing, working on? It all just really came together. So what about services? While there are some differences in regard to how the services are operated, Reverend McCharles suggested that there are enough similarities and that they can overcome any perceived obstacles. There's a willingness to look at what they have in common. So that makes for a foundation that they can build on. So the services will be, for the most part, taking aspects of each service and blending them together. The first of these services occurred on Sunday, July the 5th, with specific safety protocols in place due to the COVID-19. Reverend McCharles said those practices included physical distancing and additional Sunday services as required. The services will also be recorded and televised through NACTV in Nipawa. So congratulations to those two churches for uh, uh, bringing a new uh, clergy to the community and getting together to uh, solve some of their financial and other problems. So that's great. And that kind of brings to the end the paper, although we may have time for Charcy to, uh, to come back and read a page or so. If she's, uh, if she's out there, we'll maybe... Uh, hi, I'm back. <laughs> So here on page 7, we've got uh, Minidosa and Minto Odana begin to rebuild. Work underway to repair damage caused by massive storms by Owen Devereaux. 
While it only took a few days for the damage to be done, the town of Minidosa and arm of Minto Odana will need the rest of the summer to rebuild from several recent storms. Last week, the town and surrounding RM declared states of emergency after being hammered with heavy, heavy precipitation. Over the course of three days, anywhere between 160 to 190 millimeters of rain fell, washing out several roads and taxing local infrastructure to its limits. Minidosa Mayor Pat Scatch uh, told the Banner and Press that the damage was widespread as businesses and homes across the community were hit hard. The results of the initial storm was that you just couldn't drive down this main street. It was an actual river flowing with water everywhere, said, Sk said Scatch. The second storm followed up soon after and created additional stress, flooding basements and damaging portions of the town's roads and sidewalks. The footbridge over the Little Saskatchewan River was also wiped out. The heavy rain also triggered evacuations, as, eight, as, 84, had to as 84 people had to leave their homes Tuesday, June 30th, as a precautionary move. Now, with the, wa with the water receded, an evaluation of what needs to be done has begun. On Tuesday, July 7th, Town Council passed a resolution asking the province to declare Minidosa a state a disaster area and formally request financial assistance. Meanwhile, Sketch said the repairs have been ongoing for the past few days and that the dam at Minidosa Lake is in good shape, but will continue to be monitored by Man Manitoba infrastructure. The Rome the rural municipality of Minto Odana, which surrounds Minidosa, has been dealing with, exact, with the exact same circumstances recently. As of Monday, July 6th, there have been 18 washouts reported within Ward 1 and, with, and 7 within Ward 2. As for repairs, one of the first priorities of, for the municipal crews was to repair washed out portions of Provincial Road 466. That was due to it being the road to Evergreen Environmental Technologies Limited, the region's primary waste disposal f facility. Another important repair that will require immediate attention is to Provincial Road 471, which one Minto Odana employee identified as needing a big fix. As all this work gets underway, the arm of Minto Odana is asking people to stay away from the affected areas as there is still much work to be done by the repair crews. Then up here we have Westlake Gladstone still assessing damage from recent flood. We have a picture of Road 61 near Gladstone um, and many areas are looking similar. And we have an uh, article by Kira Patterson. While areas further west were hit with a sudden unexpected flood, the municipality of Westlake Gladstone had some time to repair for the rising White Mud waters. The White Mud River runs through the communities of Gladstone, Woodside, and Westburn, downriver from Nipua. So the municipality began preparing for the rush of water that made its way east in the days following the crest in Nipua on July 1st. Coralie Smith, CAO of Westlake Gladstone, noted that they began preparing for the coming waters July 1st and 2nd. They declared a state of emergency overnight the Wednesday into Thursday morning and began filling sandbags in Gladstone on Thursday to use in all the communities expected to be affected. We had a great turnout for volunteers for filling the sandbags, Smith added. On Friday, the water had risen just southwest of Gladstone, so they began sandbag sandbagging down the hospital and in low-lying areas of the town. Manitoba Infrastructure pulled all the logs out of the dam at Gladstone and reinforced it with large rocks. The municipality also delivered sandbags for rural res residents to use, dropping some off at Woodside and Westburn. Smith said that the flood prim primarily affected the rural areas, with approximately 20 roads that were either washed out or needed to be cut. The Gladstone golf course was also inundated. Once it got past Highway 34 West, it was really bad, Smith noted. She added that the biggest impact was the Woodside area from the White Mud River. The province had projected that the flood levels would reach three feet higher than the flood that hit Gladstone in 2011, but Smith said that they didn't get that high. We thought it could be worse, she noted, adding that there will still be a significant financial blow both to the municipality and to the farmers whose land were hit the hardest. As of Tuesday, July 7th, the crest was just north of Westburn, so the municipality was still waiting for the water to pass. 
um, through to pass through before evaluating just how much the damage would cost. The municipality was still assessing the damage to infrastructure Tuesday, but Smith said that repairs would, s would be starting this week, as they are now starting to see levels recede. If anybody knows of any damage, let the, municip the municipality know, she added. And that's all from me today. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Charcy, for helping out this week. I think you've got a job for future weeks, perhaps, too. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought we'd finish off today uh, with the article uh, by Rita Fries in her Home Buddies uh, article on page four. It's very appropriate uh, for this week uh, with the flooding that's occurred and how everybody's chipped in and helped out. It's entitled, Good Deeds Have Echoes, an Amish Proverb. It's not uncommon for a thought-provoking book to remain on the side table long after it's been completely read. Before slipping away to a night's rest, note I did not say sleep, a page or two of reading allows me to reflect on the good and positive in the world and thus in my world. It appears that most of my thoughts these days relate to the pandemic. Marking how the community works together allows the imagination to find new ways of caring and keeping in touch and the wonderful time freed for rest, relaxation, meditation and self-assessment. Working from home or still working and I acknowledge the difference. Many of the deep thoughts this week have related to floods, not pandemic. I see the same caring and ingenuity and community spirit. Good deeds have echoes. In the days ahead, there will be a symphony. Individuals dropped everything and helped fill and distribute sandbags. Family and friends offered support, lodging, food, and anything else that was required. Strangers blessed strangers. Small businesses, just some starting up, or some just starting up, offered substantial financial assistance to anyone in need. Large established businesses followed the example. Coffee was delivered, pizzas supplied, and meals provided. What an incredible support from a small community already struggling. Take your thoughts further. What if we extended this caring to every day? What if we were more willing to do without so someone could have the essentials? What if we recognized the value of the multitude of gifts we already freely offer? And we do daily offer gifts to others. One of my reflections centered on a verse from the Gospel of Matthew. We are encouraged to offer even a cup of cold water in the name of love, and we are blessed and blessing you. What does a cup of cold water look like today? Well, it looks like someone holding a door for another, respectfully keeping the proper distance in public places, walking the direction of the arrow in the marketplace. It looks like stopping to chat with a neighbor, checking in by phone or social media with one who is shut in or struggling. It looks like caring, smiling at a stranger, being polite and patient with servers, awaiting your turn. These are small acts that most of us do without even thinking about them. We expect, expect them from ourselves and others. The truth is that most times we are treated in the way we treat others. Good deeds have echoes. It is wonderful that the worst of times brings out the best in people, and that is true. Perhaps it is that only in the worst of times we look for the good. Is it only in the worst of times that we need to be shown the good? Whatever the reason, the answer I'm thankful that I get to witness the myriad of good deeds that have covered our area in the last few months. I'm thankful for each and every act that has enhanced, enriched, and encouraged another who may be struggling and tired. Let's keep it up. And a big thank you to you, Rita, too, for your very good words that you provide each week in the paper. Well, I think that gets through most of the paper. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you to Charcy for helping me out today. And uh, may the rest of your week be good.